Council of School Board to order. We'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, Secretary, we'll move the roll. Everybody except Tina here tonight. And oh no, it's on my cover. I've got it. Excellent, sir. She is not going to let me miss this. Not going to let me miss this. The school board did, in fact, hold us an executive session on Tuesday, October 16th, and earlier this evening to discuss personnel. So, with that announcement, we now have that taken care of. And the next item is public comment. Um, I have no sheets. I have no papers. Is that correct? Okay. Yes, this is a good story. Well, does anybody have any extemporaneous comments they would like to share? Anyone? Okay. Well, we're not going to start an improv night, so we will go ahead and go to the report of the superintendent. Thank you, Mr. Lingren. At, at this time, um, I would like to uh, uh, call up, if I could, uh, Mr. Boris and uh, Dr. Ramage. Um, what I'd like to do tonight is um, <clears throat> just uh, talk to you about our, our test scores. Um, and how we, how we did, we gave, you, we gave you a lot of information. We gave you data books that, that uh, are very, very inclusive and very, very specific. But what I wanted to basically just share, share with the board tonight is that in the past year, uh, we've had a lot of uh, you know, curriculum in, uh, you know, interventions along the way with math and ELA. Uh, last year, you know, we had our science review period, which will kick in this year. And what I can say to, to you as a board, that after one year, our, our staff has really um, shown results in our state testing. And I, I, look, I look at the, the, the 16, 17 school year, and I look at how we did in the PSSA pieces. And if you look at those in grades three through eight, we were actually five, five and seven, if you will. If you're doing a wins and losses, we were, you know, it wasn't a playoff year. Uh, you know, we just sort of licked our wounds and tried to figure out uh, how to get better. Well, how to get better was uh, that opportunity we had with the curriculum and how the teachers really embraced that. And, you know, um, it, it, was, it was really a, a grassroots effort because the teachers had the opportunity to pick the units and pick the, the curriculum was best, that best suited them. So one year later, if you will, uh, you know, and also in our second year, of our assessment intervention pieces, which I always, I've, I've said to you all, it's real-time data that allows us to make classroom decisions by our teachers uh, three times a year, I, three times a year. So our, our, our map data really showed us where we were going to um, possibly have our shortcomings in the PSSA. And, and it, it came true. And it, but in one category, we, out, we outshined ourselves. So this past year, in the 17-18 school year, we were nine and three. So, I, you know, that was a playoff team, if you think about it. From where we didn't make it, we were five and seven, and, and we were at or above the state average in nine out of three categories. Our first time test takers in Algebra One and the Keystone were advanced. We I mean, were, were above state average. And also, our, um, our uh, science curr curriculum, if you have the science grade in grades four, eight, really, really came up. I mean, really got close. To, we weren't at the state average. But we made very, very large gains, and we're really close to that as well. So if you think about this, we really have a, a, a really good assessment package, if you, an evaluated package from grades through 2 through 10, that we're making real-time decisions on, on every student. The ECRA piece, which we'll talk a little bit about, we talked a little bit about committee, was the ECRA piece allows us to pinpoint students' growth um, and where they're going to predict to grow at the end of the year. So every teacher has that on every student that's in their classroom. So Mrs. Smith knows where Bill Shirk can grow, and she targets that growth throughout the school year. And that is a system like no other in Montgomery County, and I really I credit you know, uh, Daniel and Dave for, for helping that piece. And really, you know, Daniel, the structural piece of getting it set up, but Dave Ramage really the... the, um, the the brains behind the piece of the analytics. If you don't have somebody to take the data to get it in the teacher's hands to make it useful, 
then it's never going to be useful. So Dr. Ramage does an excellent job with that piece, and he's really has really gravitated to that and his time spent in that integration office and has really allowed our teachers to, to, to pinpoint and our administrators their particular areas. So then that's our 2 to 10 piece, and then you fast forward and you take a look at our end results. Take a look at our PSAT scores, take a look at our SAT scores, take a look at our AP scores. We're competing with everybody. We're above, we're competing with above the state average and above the national average in our SAT scores and, and with our APs, how many kids, how many students are taking the test, as well as our three plus scores. So it's something really, it's, it's a, point, a point of pride when you think about what we do with our kids. And when you think about this, and I don't have this in front of me, but if you take a classroom of 30 students in the Potts Grove School District, 11 of those students are economically disadvantaged. So when you think about that piece, and we're always between 20, 35 and 40 percent economically disadvantaged. So when you think about that, uh, and they'll show you more statistics when it gets to, we have over, over 80 percent growth in every grade at all classifications, right? right I'm not, this is, I'm not, it's not, a, okay, I'm not, not telling any stories, but so we have growth in all of our categories, IEP, economically disadvantaged, uh, et cetera. So that, that's, a, that's a, again, a, a point of pride there. Plus, um, we're doing it at the end. So, so our students are leaving us competing at the SAT level and competing at the AP level with any of our neighbors. So I always say that's all the good things that are happening inside of Potts Grove that we want to get out, and we're going to continue <coughs> to do that. But I, I just wanted to sort of intro that piece, and uh, I know I sort of cut into some of their thunder along the way, and so you can, Good share, you can, yeah. you can, yeah, it, I wanted to summarize it for you because I, I think, I think, I, I, because those are the, those are the pieces that, that I think the board really needs to, to know about. And plus, you, you have all the information uh, of how we're doing. So, uh, gentlemen, if you want to jump in wherever you feel you need to, feel free. <laughs> yeah. Let me move a little bit. Thank you, Dr. Sir. Good evening. So we just wanted to give a 30,000 foot view. Uh, over the past several months, we really start getting data in probably mid-July, and it continues on a slow trickle right up through the winter holiday. Um, so bits and pieces come through at all different times. So to be quite honest, we still don't have all the data back. Um, so tonight is meant to give you a kind of a synopsis of the many data pieces that we've looked at. Over the last couple of months, Dave and I have given to all the board members, as well as the Curriculum Integration and Technology Committee, our volumes, we're now calling them, of, of the work that that group does. But it's really all the data that we've collected to this point in time. So we jokingly said at last week's meeting, we had volume one, volume two. There will probably, probably be a volume three. Um, so again, um, we continue to, um, our goal tonight is to give you that information, kind of that 30,000 foot view, um, but know that you have all the specifics uh, in your data packets as well. So Dr. Shark talked about our nine and three and five and seven idea. So we wanted to talk with you a little bit about what these results look like and exactly what, that, um, what we're depicting here. So there's a couple of things that even before we jump into the data, I, I want to point out to, to the board. Back, we go back to 1415 with our data. If you remember, that was the year that the assessment changed. Prior to that, we had different standards that we were held accountable. They were called PA academic standards. Now we're living under the world of PA core standards. So because all the standards changed, the assessment also changed. So they were very different tests from 1314 to 1415. So we continually go back to 1415 as kind of our benchmark year because that's all the same test, if you will. Okay. When you fast forward to 16, or excuse me, to 1718, that's when we implemented all new resources, particularly for math K through 12. So in all of our K through 12 math classrooms last year, we had all brand new resources. So remember, teachers are learning a new program, they're learning new instructional practices, they're learning new assessment pieces. Um, so keep that in the back of your mind. The other thing that also happened in 1718 is the assessment changed again. Um, so if you've been around long enough, you know that every couple years the PSSA will in fact 
change. Um, it's kind of a moving target. This time it changed and it did help us a bit because they decreased testing time for districts. But what they did was they took, they looked at specific reporting categories and they might have said where a child had 18 opportunities to demonstrate or 18 problems to demonstrate or understanding, now they might only have nine. So it decreased the testing time, but it also decreased the, the amount of chances that kids have to demonstrate their understanding of particular concepts. So again, that 17, 18, just know that the assessment changed again. So I spoke about us having new resources in place. What's typ what typically occurs when you have new resources in place, and th there's research to back this up, is what we call an implementation dip. It simply means everybody's learning something new, and uh, research shows that you tend to kind of go down during that period of time. Well, <coughs> even with all of these things, um, Dr. Shirk talked about our economically disadvantaged. We have full implementation, not just of one resource last year, but two major resources and we still saw some significant growth, so we feel really good about that. So when you look at this, um, we color-coded it for you, just to be very clear. Um, as you go across row by row, you can see different cohorts of students. So when you look across at grade three, of course, from year to year, that's always a different group of students, okay? Those areas that are yellow were performing under the state average. Those that are green were performing up at or above the state average, just to, to clearly point that out. So in mathematics, for example, in grades four, five, six, seven, and eight were performing at or above the state average, with only grade three below. <coughs> uh, when you look at our Keystone exam, we are at our highest performance rate in Algebra 1 since 1415, or actually 1516 up there. So that's a significant piece as well. Sorry, Dave. Any questions about mathematics before I go on to the next? Mr. Parker? I love that we're, in most cases, above the state average, but it also seems to me that, except for the two uh, highest grades, we dropped. Uh, so based on what I'm hearing, last year they were implementing a new program. Um, so next year we would expect to see an increase from this year's sports, correct? That would be the hope, yes. Um, the other thing that I'll point out, too, is I just look at the final column there on your far right, the PA state average. There's a trend that exists across the Commonwealth, uh, and that's as, as the grade level increases, the overall proficiency rating decreases. So you can see PA state average in grade three is 54%, and then we drop down in the state to 31% in grade eight. So, to be, you know, somebody might look at that and think, well, kids are learning less and less as they go on. That's not, in fact, the case. Because it occurs across the Commonwealth, you know, it, it, we believe it's related to standards, the rigor that's included within those standards, the assessment, what that assessment looks like, and what um, students are expected to do on a particular assessment. So continuing on with math, just talking about some of the things that we have in place, we have a lot going on, as you're, are, you're well aware. We're in our, now our second year of implementation of those resources. And because we're in the second year, teachers are much more um, adept at uh, pacing, looking at the eligible content, thinking about what students need to know and be able to do for every assessment that they face. We have some new pieces in place with Algebra 1 a, um, Algebra 1B, last year was the first year of that. Um, we have some interventions that are in place. And more and more, there's that vertical articulation. Now that the resources have been in place, grade three teachers are talking to grade four and vice versa to talk about what, it, what do my students need to know when they get to grade four? Or if I'm a fifth grade teacher, what do you want me to have my students ready when I send them off to the middle school next year? So the next uh, chart really looks at the same thing, but now we're looking at English language arts. The same things are true in that we saw for most of math that, um, as we look at English language arts. So again, 14-15 is that benchmark year. It's the year that the standards and the assessment changed. Um, again, in 17-18, we had new resources K through 8 for English language arts. Uh, and again, in 17-18, that state assessment changed on us. So again, it meant total number of opportunities for a child to show something 
decreased overall, but so did our testing time um, for that as well. The other significant piece related to this is in grades four through eight, 25 percent of the test called, um, is made up of what we call text-dependent analysis. Big fancy term, which means it requires students to look at multiple texts um, and use information from multiple texts in order to um, infer why an author is trying to do something. So for example, uh, it might ask, um, please tell me why in this passage that the author used the word, um, I don't know, pick a word, angry, to depict the, a particular character. And the t there's no actual place, there's evidence within the, the text, but there's not an actual answer in the text. When I was young, I went back to the text, I pulled that answer right out of there. Now students need to infer and kind of put pieces together in order to synthesize an answer. So that's 25% of the overall makeup of the English language arts assessment. That was new for 1718 as well. Again, when we look across specific rows, we can see what performance looks like. Again, it's color coded for you, green being at or above state average um, to, to depict what that looks like. You can see that it, um, the district met or exceeded in grades three, six, and seven, and actually in those four grade levels, we're at our highest per, um, rating or overall proficiency rating in four years. So that's a significant piece. So for example, if I look at third grade, 68%, that's my highest. Um, we've been hovering around the 60s there. When we look at trends across the state on this one, if you remember back to math, as the grade level increased, the overall proficiency level decreased. That's not the same in English language arts. You can see it all hovers right around that 60% mark. May I ask a question? Sure thing. Uh, I'm waiting because I wasn't sure if we had another Sorry. I apologize. Yeah. So the overall cumulative scores for the keystones, um, literature in 15, 16 was 82 percent, dropped 10 points a year after, went from 82 to 50, basically 56 percent in two years. Pretty big drop. So do we have an understanding what that is and, and a plan for that? So a couple of things related to that, and Dr. Shirk, you can jump in too if, you, if you'd like. Um, a couple of things that have happened here as we look at Keystone exams. Number one, if you go back a couple of years, it was a graduation requirement. It existed as a requirement for students to have to, to complete. The other thing that we were required to do as a district is offer remediation and mandate, in fact, that students attend that remediation. That's no longer the case. It's not a graduation requirement anymore. Um, and although we're, we have to offer remediation, we cannot make students attend that remediation. Um, so really, there's no, to use Dr. Shirk's words, skin in the game. Um, for a student, at the end of the day, Keystone exams don't necessarily matter as much as they once did in the state of PD, um, Pennsylvania because of how particular things used to be in place. Would you add anything to that, Dr. Shirk? And, that, and that's not, that's just, that's across the state. Uh, and there are some school districts that do, do make it a graduation requirement. Um, and uh, the results are a lot different because the expectation is a lot different. So um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough statistic for us to really, to really use as an indicator because we have some of our best kids opt out. So when you have best kids opt out of, uh, of the math component or the bio component or the lit component, um, it's not it's not really a, a true true reading so and and you know I, I will say uh, because I, I did uh, as I as I moved from my principalship down here with Dr. Ziegler at the high school to when I was assistant super I mean Dr. Ziegler had a, an excellent plan in place uh, for remediation and enrichment as well as retaking the test so kids would take the test two three four times and then we said why why we asked ourselves why some of you were in the board when we did that and we all felt that a if we're no longer going to requirement, the state's not going to allow us to remediate. And you know what? Let's focus our, our strengths on other places. We did that with AP. We did that with our SATs. And I sort of, you know, they'll, they'll show you some stuff. That's really where a lot of our results are now at that national level with AP and SAT. So, uh, Mr. Parker, that's really why um, moving forward. I mean, I'd like to see that be better, but, yeah, it's tough. All right. Two quick questions. The Keystone exam literature, uh, 
I know we've seen a decrease in stuff like that, but I know the gap has actually gotten larger. Now, it's the one school district or one area of our school that we didn't change the curriculum because the teachers at the time felt that we didn't need to change the curriculum. Has that thought changed? Uh, Dr. Zickola can answer that, but I, I do know the English department at the high school level continues to look at their resources. If you go back to when we were going through that curriculum renewal process, um, they opted not to have a new resource to use, um, and the rationale for that was they were pulling so many things from various places in order to support their, their understanding. So, for example, pulling from newspapers, pulling from magazines, pulling from various literature, um, pulling from books that are, they already have within the classroom. Um, so they opted not to have a new particular resource at that particular time. That being said, I also know they spend a great deal of time, um, and we've had training for them over the last two years, really, of coming back to that text-dependent analysis. What is it that students are expected to do on a literature exam? The keystone now looks different from what it once did. So how do students need to interact with text and kind of create understandings of that text? Uh, in order to respond on that particular exam. So I don't know, Mr. Leach, that they've had a conversation about putting a new resource into place, but they've had continual conversations about how do we improve our instruction in order to, based upon the expectations that kids have in front of them now. Second question. Obviously, I know that the overall profile is going to be completely different, and it's changing growth profile and stuff like that. Is the keystone staying on that section? or replaced in any way when we do when we eventually do get graded? <clears throat> Not yet. Oh, okay. You mean on future oh, ready? On yeah, future, future ready. ready. <clears throat> it's still part of it. Um, still part of it. Then my next question is, in, in follow-up, are we considering making it part of the graduation requirement? Uh, we, I asked, we talked about it at, at, at uh, curriculum instruction and technology. We talked about it. So I think it would have to be, we'd have to make that commitment as a board. Uh, we have to, to make to make that graduation. We'd have to all think that's important, uh, that, that that piece is there as far as what we want to see a graduate have on their, you know, have. I, I'm not so sure. If you ask me, I think, I think that what we offer, the, the, the assessment package that we offer, that we have in place for our teachers and our, and, and our students, allows us to evaluate kids real time. And then we have the PSAT that really gives us a, a national look of how we're doing in math and, and ELA and reading. And then um, we have our SAT results and our AP results. I mean, so it sort of gives you, that those pieces give you a state and national view. And, and we don't have, we have the SATs yet? Uh, we have preliminary raw data, but we do not have state or national. So I'm just gonna do, I think last year's averages. results. So last year Correct. we saw our, our, our SAT, the students that took the SAT were higher than the state average, Dr. Z, correct me, and higher than the national average. Correct. So it leads me to believe that fundamentally we're doing, we're doing something right, bless you, we're doing something right at, at that level when they get to the SAT time, the SAT time, and then the AP time with our number of, of scores, our scores that we have in like the uh, AP Lit Comp. So, I mean, I mean, if you're asking me right now tonight, I would say probably, probably not. I think I think we're educated enough as a board to understand that that piece, you know, is is just a, is a, is a snapshot of someone's time in a class. In class, if you feel stronger than that, then we need to talk about it more. Yeah. See, my, only hat on it. <laughs> my only concern will be obviously because we're graded on it, and. When you go back and you sit there and say, okay, well, how is the school district going to be graded? If that's part of the grading, whether we agree with it or not, Understood. right, it's going to be a little niche against us, right, as long as we don't see to it as being something that's more than just, hey, we're just always going to know that we're going to be due for it. We know it inside, yeah. but the people that are going to move into the district who are going to want to pay for the housing and send their kids to the district don't know that. But, but they will know our profile. They'll know our SAT and our AP profile. The only thing, I, I'm just going to, I'll just it because when I was at the conference last week, 
uh, I was at a couple uh, with colleagues in a couple different seminars, and the trend is what does a profile of a graduate look like? You know, and we we touch upon it. That's another phase for us. We're not going to touch upon it right now, but we we touch different pieces of that. But this is not. That's not one of them. Uh, they want to know what they can. You know, can we send a student out career ready? Do they know finance? Do they know real world? Do they? Those are the those are the pieces that they can they can say. Phew, you know what? I can walk out, and and I know that a Potsdam grad just happens to be Big Spring, which is a colleague of mine in Central Pennsylvania. But but we know what this this uh, this this student looks like when they walk out into the real world. So their concentration is you know uh, the career technical, the college prep readiness, uh, internships. Like you know he's trying. You know it was interesting. He's trying to get kids to go out and do internships versus taking the fifth AP course. You know, it was, it was an inter a whole interesting, it was a community thing, too. It wasn't just all about the district, but it was one of the things that the community wanted. So there's a lot more work to do. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff out there to think about. But, uh, I, you know, if we, if we want to, I understand your point, if we're going to get scored on it, you know, then our, 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 two, our student board reps, you're going to get scored on it, so we need you to do your best job possible or you're not going to graduate. You know, when... Oh, it's never yeah, right. yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> there you all, you're gonna go. If I could just point something out too, the um, keystones have been so. Trying to, I've been sitting here trying to think of the right word to use. Precarious, un, unknown, for the last unstable. how many years? Unstable. You know, first they're a graduation requirement, then they're not. Then you can remediate, then you can't. Then they have no um, project that kids who opt out can do. And nobody knows, seems to know what's going on. So I would hate to hang our hat on something like that, that maybe next year it changes again, and the year after that it changes again, then maybe it's gone. You know, so we change around our, our students' schedules and classes and stuff to accommodate something that is, we don't even know if it's gonna be around in a couple of years. I would hate to do that. We know AP is going to be here. We know the SATs are going to be here. If we could start focusing on ACT also, which I also talked to Dr. Shirk about, you know, I think that would be fantastic. And so it was just brought up recently, maybe having career fairs, if we don't already, for the kids who are not going to college, for our, our kids that are just going to be entering the workforce, maybe with a trade or something. I mean, I think that's the way to go. Like I said, real world. No employer is going to care what score you got on the keystones. Yeah, I just want to second her comment because the nationally normed PSATs and SATs, we do, uh, in my opinion, exemplary for a small school district. Uh, and uh, under those circumstances, uh, this is an interesting aside, and I'm not sure that you can read much into it because there seems to be a fair amount of variability. As I'm looking at this myself, one quick comment. The third graders in the ELA schedule in 16-17, that cohort is the fourth graders in 17-18? Okay, so they went from 65% um, in 16-17 uh, to 54% in 17-18. It went from a green bar to a yellow bar. Are we going to say that that means that that cohort is, uh, has a problem or is weak? I'm, I'm not sure. I think what we're seeing is white noise, well, what, or a good chance of white noise. Yeah, what, what we're going to say is that that particular data from grades three to four, along with our map testing, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a correlation. We'll triangulate that, that information, yeah. and, and we're on that. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, Daniel and Dave both do a really good job of taking that those kids and, and the teachers at that grade level and, and specific students in that classroom and say, hey, we have to grow these kids faster right now. Yeah, and I think this is a wonderful tool yeah. for you while the students are going through the process. But uh, ultimately what you're going to look at uh, and what you're going to remember is your senior year. And uh, so I think that's that was in the packet that you gave us. Thank you. 
So as we look at PSSA science and the Keystone exam for biology, uh, there's a couple trends that you can see here as well. Again, when we look back, we have the conversation about assessments changing, standards changing, that continues to be the same here in science as well. Um, you'll remember that last year we um, went through the curriculum renewal process for science in particular. We have new materials that are now in play this year. That This is the first year of those particular materials. So before any of that had occurred, you can see we, although we're not green, uh, we have made some, it's about five percentage points worth of growth and I, I believe about eight percentage points worth of growth um, in grade eight. So we're not green there, but we're within a percentage point of each of those. So we saw some significant gains. The question is, well, how do we make those gains if we were still using the same materials? Teachers spend a lot of time. To be quite honest, when, these, when teachers see yellow or principals see yellow, um, they often actually, when I walk into a room, they go, do you have that color-coded chart again? Are you going to tell me I'm yellow? Um, but they, they, that has a lot of meaning to them because it, it kind of lights them on fire and they say, this isn't good enough. We're not happy with this. We're going to keep fighting. Um, so in, in particular, in science, they really pulled apart what is it that students need to be able to do. Um, really pulled out particular standards and said, what does that look like on an assessment? And maybe we need to spend more time in these particular areas. So that being said, we're going to transition to MAP because one of the things that we know um, is with PSSA, we find ourselves looking in the rearview mirror. And there's some value to that, but we also know that when we can make decisions in the now with data that's much more current, um, in, in years past, we would use that PSSA data, we'd get to the end of the year, we'd review our curriculum, we'd realign things, um, we'd redo things, but at the end of the day, the kids had already moved on to a different grade level, right? So now we're spending more time focusing on the here and now data and making decisions here and now so that students aren't moving on to the next grade level before we're intervening. So Dr. Ramage is going to share what some of the MAP information looks like and how we're using this data on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, given, given discussion just a couple minutes ago, the other thing that, that I will point toward is that new Future Ready PA Index even though we, don't, we haven't seen that yet, we will. Uh, the inclination and the, the forward literature around all this is that they want to incorporate growth measures as well. So, so far we've basically looked at achievement measures, proficiency measures. Now we're also taking a look at growth. And we are, as Dr. Shirk mentioned, we're well positioned to be able to look at both. So in that sense, I think we're, uh, we should be in good shape as we move forward with the new ESSA requirements. And it may give us, you know, that first report may give us uh, a little more momentum to decide if we want to kick into a Keystone exam, for example, or go with the direction that we were just discussing. But basically, just to, to think about this uh, pie chart here, and you'll see a few of these, but what it represents is all students in their spring to spring projected growth. So as Dr. Shirk mentioned, right now we have a projection for every student for their 2019 end of year, so to speak, achievement level. And our goal, of course, is to beat that level, okay? So what the chart in this case represents is that 68.4% of students compared from spring of 17 to spring of 18 made at least their expected growth uh, based on those targets. 18.3% of students exceeded that growth and 13.3% did not make at least their projected growth in terms of math. And I'm using, I'm using MAP here because it's a good spring-to-spring -spring measure, but the, what they call a propensity score used to gauge all these projections is really based on more than a single assessment. So the analytical framework will take, bless you, will take any, any history of math achievement that the student has. If they're a second grader, obviously, we don't have much of a history built up with them. But if they're an eighth or a ninth grader or, or a tenth grader, they're going to have several PSSAs. They're going to have other MAP tests, perhaps. They're going to have PSATs. Uh, whatever we have as a nationally normed test that's viable for the framework, it kind of all gets poured in to help frame that propensity score, that projected score. And the other nice thing I'll point out is this is not proficiency. So you, so you kind of have to shift your, your thinking a little bit. 
the 18.3% of students who grew more than they were expected, it, it may have a lot of high achieving students. It, it may not. It may have a lot of students who have actually missed proficiency in things like a PSSA or a Keystone. In other words, one way to think about this, growth perhaps is the fairest measure of all. So whether I'm receiving a class of students who many are historically underperforming, or whether I have a class of gifted students who knock it out of the park on every standardized test you hand them, we still expect students to grow. We're also hoping that the students who are struggling the most are the ones who are growing further, faster, so that we can also address achievement, if that makes sense. Okay. So this is, a this is a snapshot of math growth. This is a snapshot of reading growth. So you'll see in this case, you know, it, it's similar. We have a little more meeting expected growth. We have a little more falling behind in terms of making their expected growth uh, compared to the, to the uh, math results. But again, this is grades 2 through 10 across all, um, across all, all grades taken spring to spring. Just to get a sense of how the proficiency plays out, you'll see on this chart, which happens to be a comparison of the percentiles of the MAP test. Again, we're, we're jumping back to math first. And it will show you, it's hard to see those dotted lines I know on the projection, but by 25, 50, 75, there's a, there's a dashed line. And you'll see that across the national data in terms of students who score around that 25th percentile, for example, you'll see how our students at our 25th percentile compare. And uh, except for, for example, fourth grade, it, it appears they're all at or above that 25th percentile. Now, again, I don't know if we call that a celebration because that's the 25th percentile, but at least we have a sense, particularly at grade five, at grades 7, 8, 9, 10, 10 is a great one. At least we can see in those areas we're, we're getting some nice push for our kids who are scoring below proficiency. We're helping them move closer to the proficiency bar, which in this measure is 50. 50% 50 represents the proficiency bar. Uh, and then you can look across the others. We also see in grades uh, 4 through 10, we see some good... Um, either at or above what would happen normally at the 75th percentile. So we're helping to keep some of our higher achieving students moving in a positive direction as well. Here's the similar comparison, this time for reading data. In this case, uh, I, on, on par of, of everything, I think we're making a little better gains in some ways across our reading pieces at those, at those varying percentiles. Again, in grade four, we're, we're dropping down, but in the others, uh, we're at or above that percentile achievement at, uh, at each grade level, two, three, and five through 10. So this, again, is a chance to think about how we're achieving in a proficiency sense compared to not just our own kids, but to the national norms in, in map testing across the US. Any questions on those before we start moving? through other data points? Real quick, it's not on this section. Obviously, it's on our packet here. Uh, the ECRA part. Have you guys noticed any positive trends on the ACRA versus our subgroups of being, whether they're in the subgroups of the BLK, ED, or IEP? Have you noticed any positive trends there? Uh, again, that's not. those aren't slides that are necessarily ready to dig into tonight. But as you mentioned, at committee level, those are pieces that we did look at. So the Historically underperforming students is the category the state uses. And yes, we teased out what they're the same. Um, this, this slide, okay? We did them as a, we did them as a, um, a bar graph, but uh, we looked at each grade level to say how, you know, pick sixth grade, for example. How are all sixth graders doing? And then we had a comparative part for each of the historically underperforming student subgroups so you can see them laid out. And we, we do see some trends. That's, yeah. that's the question. It, it varies a little bit grade level to grade level. Um, be honest with you, one of the things that I, that I think uh, is, a, is a great trend is how some of our IEP students are getting some of the highest growth at those grade levels, which is really encouraging. And again, it doesn't mean they're all 
hitting the proficiency bar, but it, it's great to be able to say we're moving those students faster. Unfortunately, our African American students don't seem to be making the same kind of gains, and those that are below proficiency, obviously, in that subgroup, we want to also move them quickly. So we, we have places where we want to dig in and, and learn more about it. The good news is it always represents a human being. There's a student at the end of those numbers, and that's where we're able to turn around to principals, and they turn around to PLCs, and we visit PLCs, and our coaches, and our IST teachers, and our multi-tiered support. We have a lot of ways that we're trying to use those data points that we find and those trends that we see to make a difference in instruction for students and keep them moving forward. Let's jump quickly to some of the AP uh, pieces, as Dr. Shirk mentioned. You know, over time, our total AP students has increased. Uh, we hit kind of a peak there in 2016. Uh, we, we dipped a little, and we're almost back up to that exactly in 2018. Um, we, over, over years, we've looked and we've talked about, say, the prereqs and the requirements and things to get students on board, but we have increased those numbers uh, at the same time, which is great. And we have consistently also uh, increased the number of students rece receiving a score of three or higher on the exams, which is a nice piece to move forward with. And again, points towards that maybe a national comparative kind of data. We're, we're doing a good job in moving it forward. If you just look at a glance, for example, in 2016 when we had our highest uh, number of students enrolled, we had 99% leave with a score of three or better. Uh, in, eight, in 2018, we had 169, basically the same kind of enrollment uh, figures, but we had 123 leave with a score of three or higher to take for their college transcripts now or eventually. That would represent all students in APs, not just seniors. There's another look. Um, see some of those same kind of trends. These are a percentage of three plus. We outperformed the state and the global measures in, in four of those last five years. This time by almost 5%, is that about right? 4%, 4 plus, 4.6. Okay, so again, we're showing some good gains, not only locally, but compared to state and global data. I love that one. We don't have to say national, we can say global data, <laughs> right? And then this relates a little bit, uh, Ms. Leach, to what your question was, but obviously it's not broken down into each of the subgroups, but I did want to give you a sense of what ESSA refers to as historically underperforming. Uh, they show, again, based on the projections, and we see there's some, some high growth, 22% uh, hitting higher than expected growth in our in our historically underperforming. I'm your low growth. Or uh, low growth, I'm sorry, low growth. I keep saying high growth. Um, hitting the low growth piece, so we want to keep them moving forward, but hitting almost 11% to our, to our high growth. And we're going to use these as our benchmarks going forward, so we can compare next year, we'll be able to come back to Well, it's an interesting question. One, one of the things I like, and obviously we're just entering year two, but my understanding is the better we perform, the higher the stakes become for our framework, if you think about it. In other words, if all we did was make expected growth with 100% of our students, we just like, you know, we're, we're, we're plateaued out. But when we, we can advance, say, almost 11%, then that will we'll move. Now, by the same token, if we're falling behind, for, for each individual student, it's going to take into account their <coughs> achievement level. So the framework will represent whatever those shifts are, and we'll get a better idea. Uh, they're actually coming by in the next uh, couple of weeks, next month or so, to talk a little bit about the way they frame the projections for this year to help us understand that. As we get additional data year on year on year, so say, say we've got a fifth grader, and they have several years already, and they're going to build seven more years of data, their expectation, their expected, expected growth window is going to narrow. Uh, I think uh, the best answer to that is probably depends on the student. Generally, a high generally a high achieving student may have less room for a growth window, but they're still going to have a target. So, are we moving them towards that target? So, when you think about a student who's at say a 98th percentile on a nationally normed test, they only have so much headroom to grow, but they're still going to have a growth 
target. So the framework is more about did, did they just continue and kind of live where they have been, or did they exceed what their growth projection was? Or did they remain proficient but actually slip backwards and, and fall below? what their growth was. I don't know if that exactly answers your question. It, it, it's but it was a good answer, so maybe you could take it anyway. No. <laughs> it's very close. No, what I was saying is, as a student builds a history of performing on tests, uh -huh. they're, you're going to narrow where we, their expected growth is going to be very more definitive than it is I when you. I have a second or yes. third grader. The they're going to have the more history, variability. Yeah, the so, broader right. the history, the more accurate, hopefully, the growth right. predictions are. Okay. So over time, as we get more data across more cohorts, I think it's, it's just the sample size. You know, the, the larger sample we have, both historically for all, say, second grade students who are historically performed this way and where they move, as well as individual students who move through the system. I think it, it'll just continue to get uh, cleaner and cleaner in terms of the, the reliability and the validity. Sorry, I misunderstood you at first. There's the similar. Um, play on our reading growth across our historically underperforming students. And here we see a pretty good, almost 16% of uh, students hitting higher than expected. But again, in that, you know, basically 20, 22 and 20% 20 who were still falling behind where their, where their uh, hoped expected growth would be. And that's an interesting question. How many of those are short history in the system, though, again, those are the kinds of things that we'll tease out at the, at the building levels. And then, obviously, you know, I think mostly because of the fact that we don't just prepare graphs to share at a, at a board meeting and walk away, it all represents work that we're moving inside the system. Dr. Shirk launched us this way, and it's all about taking, the analytics are only as good as what we do with them. So it's all about taking those extra pieces, putting in that extra degree, turning that, uh, turning that puddle of water into, uh, into steam as we move forward. So we are very, Danny and I are very appreciative of the, both the building leaders and the PLC teams because they, they really, as Daniel mentioned, they just, they're not content, and that's a very good thing. And they really, they really dig in. They're getting more and more comfortable with the data. We try to support them in any way we can. And I think it's really making a difference in our instruction, a difference for our kids. It's the bottom line. Thank you both. Okay, moving on to action items regarding personnel. Can I make a motion to combine 5.1 to 5.6? Second. We have a motion and a second to combine action items 5.1 through 5.6. Does anybody have any questions or comments on the motion or on any of the aspects of them? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. All those opposed say no. Thank you very much. So approved. Moving on to action items for business. Uh, 6.1 school bus bid award. Uh, we're asking the board to approve the bid awards for two 72 passenger buses and one 20 passenger bus slash van to the lowest responsible bidder as presented. We have a motion and a second to approve action item 6.1 on the school bus bid award. Uh, does anybody have any questions or comments on this? I'm wondering uh, with the unexpected large expense uh, on the middle school bridge if we should do what we've done in the past without significant issues and uh, not purchase uh, two new buses this round to give us some, some extra cash to spend on that bridge. Other thoughts? The, uh, the, brid the bridge will be coming out of capital reserve funds, and uh, this is a budgeted general fund expenditure, uh, if that makes any difference. Okay, very good. All 
those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed say no. No. Moving on to 6.2, school bus radio upgrade. We're asking the uh, board to um, award the quote for the upgrade to school bus radios to the lowest responsible bidder as presented. Second. We have a motion and a second to upgrade our school bus radios. Does anybody have any questions or comments on this item? I did have a question. Do these radios, we just... Um, the district radios that we recently purchased, are these able to work with those in case there is a district emergency? Or are they a completely separate system? Uh, they're, they're a completely separate system. They're on a different band to okay. communi communicate with the... Uh, uh, right. Uh, now, CMD, will have, we, we are in the process of purchasing a, uh, a base station for CMD because we found that there was some interference in the radio transmission on emergencies to them. They will have a, a radio as well. Okay. Are there any questions on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. So ordered without objection. Moving on to action items for education. I'd like to make a, a motion to define We have a motion, a second, to approve the action items on education, 7-1 through 7-3, conference attendance. Um, are there any questions on any of these items? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed say no. No, 7.3 only. Very good. All right. Okay, uh, moving on to uh, action items regarding policies, 8.1, approval of revised policies. Uh, we're asking the board to approve the revised policies as submitted uh, to 10-1, uh, 311, uh, 806, and 808. We have a motion and a second to approve the revised policies as presented. Uh, do we have any questions on any of the policies or any of the, the action item? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. So ordered without objection. Uh, commit, committee items, we're asking the board to accept the minutes for the policy board committee meeting held on September 25th, 2018, as submitted. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the policy committee meeting and the curriculum and integration and technology committee meeting minutes. Does anybody have any questions on them? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. So ordered without objection. Uh, moving on to uh, committee items 9.2, the Curriculum Integration Technology Committee. Uh, we're going to report out on that tonight. Board members that were there were uh, myself, uh, Mr. Lapic, and Dr. Nippert, and uh, there was health teachers there and also world language teachers and uh, some administrators. And we started out with the health curriculum update. Uh, we are changing the health curriculum, and the um, health department has been very active and um, diligent in working to get a very current an up-to-date curriculum and uh, we talked a lot about um, the online class which is currently offered independent health which is offered at in the high school and whether that would continue uh, with this new curriculum if it would not if it would change and the uh, health department is going to um, talk about that at the next staff development and just see what they can do to possibly pare down the amount of students that take that class and if they do take it have some um, mandatory discussion times 
that they would have to meet um, maybe three or four times throughout the semester to talk about what they're learning about online. Um, all in all, it seems as if it's panning out pretty well. We had uh, we talked to the world language teachers and talked about adding a third language. And um, if we, if and when, hopefully we do, it'll be French. And we talked about the exploratory program starting in sixth grade, uh, and just about some of the issues that were arising and different things that just came up. And um, they're going to meet again. We're going to meet with them again and talk over more options, I guess. And just uh, we did ask them when they left to look into. We were given three options, and we picked option two, which was an exploratory, along with adding a third language of French. So, but it still needs to be voted on by the board. And then we did a very quick data review, which you guys just saw, uh, quite a bit of it, and uh, everything looked good there. And we managed to adjourn four minutes before nine, which I was pretty proud of. <laughs> yeah. So that's it. Uh, yeah, just a quick really. question, and yeah. this may go back to you, as into the scenarios one through four that we got with the pricing and such like that, are the reason why the current .5 Spanish and current .4, I mean .5 German moving to full time is so much more than hiring a new .5 is it because of their scale, is that what it is? Is that why we're going from 48 for one to 158 for two? I don't have the information in front of me, but can you restate that one more time? Yeah, so on scenarios, it's got current 0 0.5 Spanish and current 0.5 German are going to move to full time. They're going right? to get health care benefits. Yeah, they're going to get health care. That's why I voted that. Okay, and so, so the first is so. plus full benefits. So a half a teacher costs $48,000? Yeah. Full benefits. No, there's no benefits you said. There's no benefits. With, with retirement. But if you, if you add benefits to it, it's going to take another $20,000 plus. Okay. And then let, one last question. The new full-time Spanish-German teacher, if you go to scenario four for third language of Roxanne West, was that for all the classes? Because I remember originally you guys were talking about going, you know, one at a time and moving it more incorporated. Or is that just now, if you did it, you would just do all K through three? That was, they didn't know yet because it was, it, it was, it was a guesstimate just to give an idea of that it's going to cost a lot more, but without, there has been so many discuss, discussion and there's so many options of ways to tackle it that it's not a realistic price until they go back and do that, but they just wanted to get it, throw it out there and then they're going to go back and look and start coming up with different scenarios to get a realistic range of prices for doing that. The only reason my question would be in that is if. And of course, that's a big if. If they went with that, would they really need the exploratory then? If you already have three the languages idea was throughout K through five or six, would you really need to do exploratory anymore? The idea with that was that it would be an exploratory, the K through five, and then go into full-time classes at some point in the middle school. Okay. That, but that's just an idea. There's still, you know, I mean. There's a lot of time before they discuss that, so. Two quick answers. Uh, number one, I'm, I think the language people should probably explain more detail what's going to happen, but I think the exploratory part was an enrichment part so that students, when they went to, went to just pick their language, could more intelligently decide. And I think that's part, that's part of the passel. Now the cost, and this is a response to a question I asked at the meeting, the total cost estimate has to go through uh, the gentleman to my left uh, with the green eye shade, who's going to give us a more detailed estimate because the numbers at the bottom of the line were uh, basically ballpark estimates and 
uh, don't uh, reflect what the actual final cost is going to be. But yeah, the actual final cost is going to be significant. For the full time? For what, uh, yeah. You know, for all any of the options. Is the plan to get it back to the full board for approval in one of the scenarios by January, February, I'm guessing? What, what, what our plan is, we're going to meet in November and uh, try to uh, finalize. I mean, right now, we're really looking at scenario three. Okay. Um, and final, finalize scenario three for the board uh, to present. But we, we wanted to give Mr. Nestor time to at least build that number into the budget so that, so that when he presents his, the, the preliminary budget in January, that uh, that's reflected. We can, we can, all, we can move that around um, as we move through the budget process. You know, we can... We can talk more about it as we go, but but I I want to get it in so the board had a, the true picture of yeah. of the cost. All right, this time we're ready for any new business that anybody has to discuss. Are there any takers? Yeah. Okay. Um, last Friday, I did attend the 2018 PSBA Delegate Assembly. And um, it was quite an eye-opener, and I really feel, and I did express that I do feel there's a disconnect between PSBA and our local school districts. You know, we had abstained for the officers we didn't really understand, and um, I think somebody on the board of Potsgrove, we have to start getting involved a little bit, because I didn't realize with this assembly, and I've been on the board, what, nine years now, they go and they make all these changes and can change the bylaws, which would affect us, but we're, we're not there to say, say our, our voice, hear our voice. So, um, so it was really a great session. It was exhausting, but it was a great session. And um, there had to be like 300 people there. And I think PV had like four people they sent. But, um, but it was a great conference. I mean, they, we, we adopted the agenda and the rules of the procedures. And then we did the report for the PSBA bylaws committee, which there was no bylaws change, but if, if, for instance, at a local level that we felt as a board, Potsgrove, that we would want to change something or have something go to the platform, that is done between March and June. I never knew that we could actually get involved, like you were saying about the keystones. If we really opposed to that being an issue, then we as a voice have to get involved, and then it would be under consideration that could go to this meeting for all of the uh, school boards in the state of Pennsylvania um, to vote on. So uh, there was no changes in the bylaws, which that went really quickly. Then we made an adoption of the 2018 core principles and supporting concepts for the PSBA platform. Um, not much with the treasurer's report. And then they did discuss the elections, which we abstained from for the officers. But again, I just feel somehow it really would benefit us as a whole to know what's going out there. And one incident that one guy had told me, I forget um, his name, uh, he was an officer for the PSBA, but he said, they're, they're talking about making a mandate in Harrisburg, and they're an advocate for us in Harrisburg. So be, basically for all new school buses, if they were to say, okay, the state is going to mandate us that we have to have harnesses, seatbelts for the kids, basically we're going to say, as the school board and the PSBA will let you, you're going to have to fund it for us. You know, it's, if you mandate things, you're going to come up with the money. So it was amazing to see such strong voices um, for us. But I just think locally for us, we need to, and I'll, I'm going to actually stay on top of the PSBA a little bit and kind of just keep an eye out what's going on out there. But I had no idea how important this was. And, to my knowledge, we never really attended this assembly, so um, it was really, it was really, really good. So, just wanted to report back, and I'll keep you posted. One thing I'm going to do a little plug, of course, for our athletics and such mm -hmm. like that. Not the booster club. I'm going to yes. plug. You got the uh, athletics. You got a lot of playoffs that are starting. Uh, you got the Wednesday. You got boys soccer, which is going to be home. We got Friday, we have girls soccer, which will be home. Friday, obviously, is also the football championship. Word to the wise, come early if you want to park anywhere near the school. Otherwise, you're going to be parking about a mile away because they expect it to be very large crowds, especially for Friday. 
come very prepared for the weather because it is going to be very cold. Otherwise, I will sell you lots of blankets, of course. <laughs> you know, come on down. I'll sell more blankets, of course. But I, I'm telling you, you're going to want to come prepared. So, I believe they're closed at school lane. Okay. School lane is going to be closed. Uh, and then, of course, uh, everything else is going to be very interesting. Oh, oh, last thing. We also had the middle school uh, cross uh, track thing today, cross country. We had like 1,300 students came today. And I, th I understand that one very well. So congratulations for having so many students and taking care of those skills as well. Do you have anybody else for new business today? There. Sorry. Really? You leave me dry today? All right, very good. All right, then we'll come back to public comment. We had no takers earlier on. You've had a chance to hear some stimulating conversation and ideas. Anybody, anybody want to join this fray? No? Then I am ready for motion to adjourn. We lost the move to Okay.